Good evening. Welcome to tonight's program on the Renaissance of Rhyme. I'm Rebecca Roberts. I'm the curator of programming at Planet Word. We are a museum of words and language in downtown DC uh, in, in the historic Franklin School, which is that very cool building in my Zoom background. I hope many of you have had a chance to visit the museum. Um, we are open Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 10 to 5. Admission is free. Uh, if you have uh, visited us already, and if you found out about this program because you're already on our mailing list and you got our newsletter, uh, and maybe you're even a member, thank you very, very much for that support. That's how we're able to keep admission free and be able to do programs like this one. Uh, if you found out about this program through another channel and would like to know more about Planet Word and what we have to offer, planetwordmuseum.org is the website. Um, follow us on social media or sign up for our newsletter, sort of the best way to know what's going on uh, with us. So that's it for the business. Um, I am delighted to welcome both of our guests this evening. I'm joined by Sue Ellen Thompson, who is an award-winning poet and a teacher. And if you live here in the Washington area, you might have taken some workshops with her, um, or you don't even have to live here anymore. That's the beauty of remote workshops. Um, and Adam Bradley, who's a professor at UCLA um, and an author of the Book of Rhymes, The Poetics of Hip Hop, but he's also on the Planet Word Advisory Board. So if you have been to the museum and uh, have been in our karaoke gallery, where as you sing the lyrics, you're learning songwriting techniques on the same screen, you can thank Adam for helping us put that together. So Adam Bradley and Sue Ellen Thompson, welcome to the program. Thank you, Rebecca. So, you know, the idea for this program about the renaissance of rhyme, uh, it's come up a couple of different, in a couple of different contexts of, of programs we've done for Planet Word. Um, most recently, we had uh, Lisa New from Harvard on talking about poems for the pandemic. And she said, you know, rhyme had completely fallen out of favor with poets. It, it was, you know, considered a little old fashioned and um, not what new poets did. And then hip hop completely brought rhyme back and made rhyme cool again. Um, and so that's sort of our jumping off point, but I would love to hear from each of you. And so Ellen, maybe we'll start with you uh, from your perspective as a poet, sort of where you stand on rhyme in general. Okay, well, I went to Middlebury College, which is known for among other things, um, it's graduate program in English, the Breadloaf School of English, where Robert Frost taught for many years, and for the Breadloaf Writers Conference, which I believe is the oldest writers conference in the United States. And Robert Frost helped found that. And I spent probably um, a total of 16 or 17 summers on the Breadloaf campus. So my whole education as a poet was very much grounded in the Robert Frost tradition. Now Frost wrote rhyming as well as unrhyming poetry, but it's certainly his rhymed poems, you know, Think Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening or The Road Not Taken that are some of the most widely known and best loved American poems today. So um, when I got out of school, I started writing poetry. And then I began reading more contemporary poets who were writing in free verse. And I thought this sounds so much more modern and free and it was so much better suited to um, the kinds of subjects I was writing about. So I sort of embraced um, free verse, but I always retained a healthy respect for uh, rhyme and form in poetry because of my background. Mm. You know, of course, the other thing Middlebury is known for is it's weather. My fresh, my son is a freshman there and I think it snowed today. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, Adam, what about you? Where, where on the rhyme continuum would you put yourself? Mm. Well, rhyme to me is a point of entry into how people can play with words. I have two young daughters, seven and 10, and, and just seeing them in their early childhood getting so much glee out of being able to uh, see how different words can meet each other through familiarity and difference. You know, that's ultimately what Rhyme at a Space is about. It's a, a certain sonic familiarity, cat and bat, 
in its most simple sense, but also that difference of the k with the b. And so from a very, very early part of my life, I came to find so much joy in the play of words in, in rhyme. And uh, that's, I think, what drew me initially to hip hop was in addition to the, the beats and the propulsive energy and the music was the, that inventive sense of doing things new with language. So that's my point of entry and it's the thing that keeps me coming back to song lyrics more broadly, to rap in particular, and to poet, poet, poetry that finds a way on the page to use rhyme in ways that are innovative and distinctive. Yeah, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you on the playfulness of rhyme. Um, and then there is thought provoking rhyme, you know, it can sort of do all of the above. Um, so Sue Ellen, why do you think literary poets turned away from it? Well, it's interesting because Adam talked about, you know, watching a child's delight in language and rhyme. I think as we get older, particularly into uh, college age, we think that rhyme is something, you know, that belongs to childhood, nursery rhymes, children's rhyming books, um, you know, becomes associated with a kind of elementary um, kind of poetry and that it's not sophisticated. And actually that's not at all true. I think also we are a little bit damaged maybe by um, reading some of the really bad rhyming verse that was written in the, <laughs> and even in the 20th. And I think that's a problem. We, we start associating rhyming poetry with either childishness or just plain bad poetry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have, a, I have a dear friend of mine, the, the DC based, based poet, Kyle Dargan, who, gosh, probably a decade ago said to me, if someone hands me a poem that rhymes, I want to tear it up right in front of their face. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's, he's mellowed in his perspective, in part because he is also a lover of hip hop and understands the flexibility and fluidity of rhyme. And as a teacher, too, yeah. deep rooted in uh, teaching you know, every, every you know, successive year, a new batch of students, I think he, he understands the, the subtleties that rhyme can bring, but he's onto something though. And it's the thing that Sue Ellen mentioned that there's been so much bad poetry written <laughs> by virtue of rhyme with rhyme as the only uh, characteristic that people associate and even to this day with what a poem is. When you tell a group of uh, young people, even you know college age students that I deal with all the time, write a poem. Usually the first thing that they think about is rhyme. And I think that's uh, been to the disservice of so many other rich features of what poetic language can be. In the right hands, rhyme though can be miraculous. Well, do you think the embrace of rhyme by hip hop has gone some way towards correcting that childishness image? I think so. And even before someone in the chat mentioned Muhammad Ali and the kind of verbal sparring and, and play of sound that Ali engaged with. And there's something to be said in the oral tradition writ large. And we can go <clears throat> all the way back millennia for this to think of how rhyme functions as a mnemonic, a mnemonic device, a device of memory, in addition to being a, a device of the, the pleasure of, of sonic recognition. Uh, in the contemporary sense, through the United, throughout the United States, we've seen, particularly in the African-American community, uh, rhyme as a part of the, the verbal games uh, that we play of you know, the dozens and, and snapping and all these sorts of things that were at least one of the influences that gave birth to hip hop in the 1970s, first in the South Bronx with the the very straightforward sing-songy rhymes that are very much like the nursery rhymes that Sue Ellen mentioned. Um, think about Rapper's Delight, the first major mm -hmm. hip hop song to break through into the mainstream. I said a hip hop, a hip to the hip the hip hip hop and you don't stop, a rock and said bang bang, you know, that kind of stuff. The, the playful sing-songy uh, echoes of sound and rhyme and other kinds of devices of repetition. That's certainly a part of what uh, hip hop initially brought. And, as it continued to evolve over the years, it layered on sophistication 
you know, using slant rhyme and, and a whole variety of, of different kinds of rhyming techniques, mosaic rhyme, uh, multisyllabic rhyme of all types. This is at least one of the ways that I think hip hop has pushed the art form of rhyme uh, in songwriting and in poetry more broadly forward and challenged poets to pick up that mantle on the page and to think about how they might rhyme with greater versatility. Well, define those terms for us a little bit. So you said slant rhyme, mosaic rhyme. Tell us what you mean by those. Well, and might be able to break down some of those with, with greater accuracy. Yeah, we, there, there are a number of different types of rhyme that both literary poetry and rap share. I mean, I, I learned that from reading Adam's book. I mean, exact rhyme is what we're most familiar with. When two words share, a vowel sound and the consonants that follow, you know, breath, death. Um, another broad category of rhyme is called slant rhyme or off rhyme. And the two words share some sound, but it's not the vowel and the consonants that follow. Breath might rhyme with earth or something like that. Breath might rhyme with less. So it's not even the final consonant, um, but that's a broad category. You know, breaking that down further, I would say the ones that are most common in both rap and literary poetry, and jump in here, Adam, because you know more about that than I do, um, is light rhyme, which is rhyming the stressed syllable of one word with the unstressed syllable of another. And by stress, I, I simply mean when you look in the dictionary, you know, the little accent mark <laughs> over a certain syllable. Well, that's that's stress. Um, light rhyme, an example of that might be she and poverty. See, she is stressed, the T in poverty is not. Um, it can be even the middle syllable of the word. For example, intensity, and nonsense, that would be a light rhyme. And it's just so much more interesting than exact rhyme. Um, another category uh, would be apocopated rhyme. Similar, but it's when a final syllable, often a one syllable word, not always, is rhymed with the next to last or the middle syllable of another word, but they're both stressed which is the difference between that and light rhyme. For example, arrangement and change. That would be an apocopated rhyme. Caring and there. Um, I rhyme. And this probably doesn't work in rap because I rhyme depends upon seeing it on the page. Two words that look on the page like they should rhyme, but are pronounced differently. For example, um, move, M-O-V-E, and love, L-O-V-E, or cough, C-O-U-G-H, and rough, R-O-U-G-H. Um, that's the kind of rhyme that you have to see on the page, but it is considered rhyme. And what I'm curious, when you said mosaic rhyme, Adam, is mm. that the same as what I would call broken rhyme? Mosaic, it, it might be, I mean, mosaic as, I understand it is rhyming one multisyllabic word with several single syllabic words. So a great example, I just heard it the other day actually and, and wrote it down to make sure I had the words right from uh, Judy Garland seeing Irving Berlin's classic, I wanna go back to Michigan from the 1948 musical Easter Parade. Don't ask me why I was watching that one Sunday on, on TV, <laughs> but I was. And she has this wonderful, uh, portion where she's singing the Berlin lyrics and, and she's rhyming Michigan, something that would seem to defy rhyme, that, that multisyllabic state name with Wishigan and Fishigan. And what we have there is the patterning not only of the, the rhyme, but also the rhythm, that dactylic rhythm, the stressed and then two unstressed syllables, wish again. Da, da, da. It's, it's a beautiful little dance of sound that fuses rhythm and rhyme together. You know, I just read a poem too, where um, head of his was rhymed with lettuces. 
<laughs> all about rabbits. <laughs> I mean, this is great. And it usually is turned to a comic end, but you know, rappers have a, adopted and adapted this kind of mosaic rhyming for, for often much different kinds of emotional ends. Sometimes it's comic, like uh, Kanye West, years before he went crazy, uh, had a rhyme on this song called Gold Digger where he rhymes the names Trina, Serena, as in Serena Williams, and Genifa, as in Jennifer Lopez. So <laughs> Trina, <laughs> Serena, and Genifa. And that kind of bending uh, of the, the sounds to meet one another is uh, a, a technique that I like to call transformative rhyme. I mean, there, I couldn't really find a name for it, but it's- Oh, I have a name. I, I, I call it wrenched rhyme. Very it's similar. You're wrenching you know, the word to make it rhyme. You're wrenching the pronunciation, but it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So uh, we've started to touch a little bit on rhythm and meter, which obviously is absolutely part of the conversation about rhyme. Um, and at the same time, we have a question from uh, an audience member, because Sue Ellen, you brought up free verse. Right. So um, the question is, do you look at free verse as having no structure? Um, and I, since the answer is going to be no, it has to, <laughs> um, I, I just want to hear your thoughts sort of on okay. structure and meter, how meter differs from rhythm. Okay. All right, well, rhythm is simply the pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables in, in, in a line of poetry or over several lines. When that pattern is fixed and repeated, we call it meter. I had um, someone once compare it to music, those of you who've taken piano lessons and can remember back to the metronome. They said, meter is what the metronome does. Rhythm is what the composer does. Huh. And I, I think of free verse as being poetry that does not employ rhyme or any kind of fixed and repeated rhythmic metrical pattern. Would you agree with that, Adam? I think that's beautifully put. And, and we've seen the, the revolution in free verse throughout the better part of the 20th century into our own. And, and you see it in terms of uh, poets seeking other ways of ordering their lines, whether it's through line break, lineation, you know, how you use the, the space of the page, both the, the blank space and the, the space of, of your, your written line. And, and poetry in part can be defined as the art of the line. Mm -hmm. as the, the conscious choice of where to break that line that those of us who are struggling only to write prose, we leave that up to the typesetter. But uh, <laughs> Sue Ellen and others uh, get to actually take a hand in deciding where they want their lines to end. And, and that too is such a powerful tool for form. And, we, and poets have so many others in their toolbox to use beyond just uh, rhyme and, and, and uh, rhythm patterns. Well, you've heard the famous um, cross quote about uh, that writing free verse is like playing tennis without the net. I don't know if that's apocryphal or not, but <laughs> you know, we've all sort of heard that. And, and the, the fact is that writing free verse is hard because then you have to decide where to end the line. If you're writing a rhymed and metered poem, that determines where the, where the line ends. So it's actually not so easy. No. So, so you, Sue Ellen, you mentioned um, Robert Frost and stopping by Woods on a snowy evening. I'm gonna share that poem okay. and take us through um, the rhythm and meter here. Okay, yeah. And this is a horse that has, I mean, this is a horse. This is a poem <laughs> that has both rhyme and meter. And I will show that by exaggerating uh, the meter slightly. Stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. 
The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Now you can hear uh, my voice falling into a rhythm. It's hard almost not to, if you try to concentrate on reading the sentences instead of the lines, um, you can avoid it. But some lines have, you know, whose woods these are, I think I know. And some lines, you know, the darkest evening of the year of easy wind and downy flake, they all have that same pattern which, you know, for those who are into terminology is um, known as iambic tetrameter. But um, not all poems, not all rhyming poems have this. I mean, I suppose in rap, you have to have rhythm, right, Adam? Well, in, in part because you already have the rhythm of the beat. So as is true, of course, in, in any song lyric across all genres, there's a, a, a way that uh, the, the fixed patterns of rhyme and rhythm have, well, particularly of rhythm, have a hard time coexisting with the, the strictures and demands of the music itself. So, uh, you know, having talked to many songwriters and, and rappers, uh, one of the big challenges, of course, is to whether you write to the beat or you write lyrics and then have a beat build around it. And most rappers write to a beat. So they already have that kind of metronomic structure in mind, usually a four, four musical structure where, wherein they're able to, to nest their, their words and find a, a kind of dynamic relationship between voice and rhythm of the music itself. And what I call the dual rhythmic relationship between rapper and beat. Yeah, I would say that in in literary poetry, the you know the rhythm or meter, if there is one, emerges during the writing process. You write a few lines, and hmm, you know you pick up the rhythm, and then you decide to go with that and write a few more lines. It sort of emerges with the writing, or it disappears, in which case you end up with free verse. But I know that's true in my own work is that um, a loose meter will emerge in the early drafts of a poem. And then I have to decide whether to pursue that or not. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Frost poem is so metrical that um, I sang a choral arrangement of it in high school, right? It absolutely lends itself to being sung. I had the alto harmony running through my head as I was typing it up for that slide, actually, apparently 35 years later, it's still in my head. Um, but the other thing I think that stands out about that poem is rhyme scheme, right? It's one of the things we're all taught um, when we're taught to analyze a poem, and that's A, A, B, A, but then the B line becomes the A line of the next stanza. Um, how does rhyme scheme just... Explain rhyme scheme for us a little bit and tell me why it matters rather than it just being something high school kids memorize. Well, a rhyme scheme is simply a repeated pattern of end rhymes in a poem, um, usually indicated by matching letters to the words that rhyme. So A, B, A, B, or A, B, B, A, you know, that sort of thing. Um, certain forms of poetry, like the sonnet, have widely known and recognized and established rhyme schemes. Um, if you bring up the slide, I will show you, um, I have in my book, The Golden Hour, I wrote, oh, I don't know, many, many of these sonnets. And I decided to take the typical English, also known as Shakespearean rhyme scheme for a sonnet which is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, and try to use slant rhymes, light rhymes, apocopated rhymes, something to make it sound uh, less traditional and sing songish. And this is one that I came up with. It's called Five Kids. My mother claimed she could tell us apart by the sound of our peeing. Lying in bed, she knew my older sister's bossy gush, the spurts of impatience from my younger sister, 
the altitude induced tonal differences of the two boys. She said, my pee was tentative and ladylike, something I enjoyed hearing because I was neither. If I was sick in the middle of the night and cried out mom at the crescendo of my retching, something I still do in my head, she'd be at my side already with her, I'm here honey and the right toothbrush. As for my only child, my daughter, I think I don't know half as much about her. I should, I should mention that um, I have an only child who was an extremely challenging teenager. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there you can see, um, I have, I rhyme apart with spurts. So that would be an apocopated rhyme, right? Adam? I have new and altitude, that would be a light rhyme, but they're slant, they're not quite perfect. Um, tentative and sick would be a light rhyme. Uh, do and toothbrush would be apocopated. And then we have what, what I call broken rhyme. Your, your term was mosaic rhyme, Adam, daughter and about her. And I think, or I hope anyway, that when I read the poem, it didn't immediately strike you as a rhyming poem. Um, the idea is to soften the, the chiming at the end of the lines so it doesn't sound so sing-songy. Not only would I have not necessarily identified it as a rhyming poem, I wouldn't have, just from hearing you read it, deduced the sonnet structure. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes back to what you were saying about where you break the lines. I mean, you actually broke a line, you broke a stanza in the middle of a hyphenated word. Right. Uh, you know, so in the vocal performance of it, the underlying structure isn't very obvious. Yeah, well, that's the whole idea. That's the whole idea is to kind of update um, the sonnet form, which has loosened up a lot in this century. And a lot of sonnets are still being written but the form itself and the rhyme is being played with. The thing I love about this is that it, it pays homage to the form and is, is faithful in so many ways to the form, yet it, it also uh, reconsiders the possibilities inherent within the structure and, and just the thing that Rebecca pointed to of, of altitude induced. I mean, that, that moment, the, the tension between the logic of the syntax and the logic of the lineation creates this really generative heat to, in my reading you know, and energy and excitement when you read the poem on the page. And uh, it's, it's a testament to the, the artful structures and the, the real natural uh, beauty of the poem that, that we, it doesn't call attention to its form in that way, that it calls attention instead to what the poem is about. <laughs> You know, and, and ultimately that's what, what I think we want to do, right, as poets. Absolutely. You know, when I uh, wrote The Golden Hour, my mother was dying. And I found that writing in form, that sonnet form, that the tighter the container, the better able I was to express emotion mm. without lapsing mm. into melodrama or sentimentality. I found it so helpful. And the other interesting thing is that many of these sonnets, I wrote the final couplet first. Hmm. If I found that if I could come up with that, I could write the three stanzas that le leading up to it. And I often wrote the two rhyming words, I mean, the two rhyming lines at the end before I wrote the rest of the poem, something that's never happened to me before or since. You know, that, that reminds me of Elizabeth Bishop writing her, her great poem, One Art, which is born, if those of you who know the poem, the art of losing isn't hard to master. You know, that, that line resonates. And, and that poem was born out of a series of really searing personal trials and losses of loved ones and, and a lot of things in her life. And if you go through the history of that poem's development, what you see is it begins with an emotional outpouring that looks very much like prose in the first draft, where she's just writing, you know, you, you, the things that she's lost. And then over the course of the draft upon draft upon draft, she is um, restraining 
it formally, even as she is distilling it emotionally. And that, that back and forth, it seems very much in keeping with what you've described, Sue in your own process. It's fascinating. Um, and I should say, Sue Ellen's book, The Golden Hour, Adam's book too, um, you can get through our bookshop.org link. Um, we would love to be able to have a little bit of support for Planet Word as well as our guests for um, following up on their work. Um, so when we talk about uh, the difference between a poem that's written down and one that's performed out loud, I think, you know, spoken words poetry is having a little bit of a moment right now in part because of Amanda Gorman at the inauguration in the Super Bowl. Um, and poetry that is written to be performed is its own art form, right? I mean, I think that people who don't know a lot about spoken word poetry or slam poetry don't really realize that it's its own thing, but they're getting introduced to it now. And to me, it almost feels like the transition art form between poetry and music. Um, but I'd be curious, Adam, let's start with you, what you think about spoken word poetry. You, you're, you're right to make the useful distinction between spoken word and other forms. And of course it, it has its own uh, roots, particularly slam poetry, which emerges in Chicago uh, in and around the 1980s and, and it reaches a kind of saturation in a broader context through the 90s and early 2000s that then blends with hip hop uh, mm -hmm. and other kinds of oral forms of, of poetic expression. And then many of those same slam poets then find themselves writing for the page. I was talking to one such individual, wonderful poet out of Chicago named Nate Marshall. And he was kind of a, a, a child prodigy of the slam poetry movement in, in Chicago in the early 2000s, mid, to, mid first decade of the 2000s. And uh, at, he told me that at that time he was writing in three ways. He was writing for the page, just literary poetry. He was writing and performing rap lyrics with his friends. And he was writing slam poetry, which he understood at that time as a script for performance. Mm -hmm. So he toggled among these various modalities of poetic expression, knowing that they were drawing from some of the same internal sources, yet expressing themselves in these different ways to different audiences. And he tells me now as, now as the author of multiple books of poetry that he brings that slam sensibility to the way he writes his literary verse uh, for the page that he wants there to be uh, a, a spoken iteration of the language in the, in the heads of his readers who, who open up his book. And I think it's just a wonderful way of bridging some of these divisions of form. Well, you know, it's a well-known fact that not all uh, literary poets are good readers. In fact, some of the best poets are terrible readers of their work. Um, I'm always, you know, my feeling has always been when I read a poem in front of an audience, I just want to be me. I want to be straightforward. I want to be true to the language, but I, want, I don't want that poem to depend on how I read it for its effect. I want it to have the same effect when someone reads it to themselves on the page. Um, that, you know, the Amanda Gorman thing is interesting because I was just following comments and stuff on Facebook and I saw a lot of comments um, from poets of sort of my generation that said, I want to see that poem on the page. You know, I, I want to check that out and make sure that we're not just being swept away by the yellow coat and the, you know, the Prada headband and her beauty. I really want to read that poem on the page. So I think there is a little bit of suspicion um, among literary poets about spoken word for poetry, I would say. Um, usually poets identify as one or the other. There are not that many that can do both. Hmm, interesting. Do you think about how your po poems sound out loud when you write them on the page? I certainly read them to myself out loud. And that's how I pick up uh, rhythmic dead spots, bad word choices, that kind of thing, is to try to hear them as an audience would hear them. So yes, I do. But I certainly don't, I don't think of myself as performing them. I think of myself as reading them out loud as I would read them to myself. 
Yeah, interesting. You know, you also, Adam, you touched a little bit on this um, that, you know, um, uh, uh, hip hop has a improvisational element. So, uh, you know, there is pure sort of freestyle rap battle improvisation, but there also is, um, there's something that's a little bit live, you know, to, to writing those rhymes um, in a way that as you talked about, you know, is different from slam poetry or written poetry or not just in that it's set to music, but also that there's something a little bit extemporaneous about it. Um, does that affect the rhythm, the meter, the rhyme when you're a little bit making it up as you go along? Well, I, I would say that I, I would be wary of painting rap with a broad brush in as much as there, and I'm not, not saying you're doing that, but I, I think it's worth pointing out the different ways that rappers, just as different poets approach their craft in radically different ways, the same is true in rap. One, one quick example, there is a category of, of rap that emerges entirely composed in the head. So we can think of the Notorious B.I.G., we can think of uh, Jay-Z, uh, someone I collaborated with, the rapper Common from Chicago, the rapper and actor Common. He composes entirely in his head. So those rappers, Lil Wayne is another example out of New Orleans. If you listen to their rhymes, I, at least I can listen <laughs> with that knowledge and hear clues that they are doing certain things that one would naturally do by virtue of that composition method, as opposed mm -hmm. to Eminem, for, for instance, or as opposed to Nas or Talib Kweli or, or Kendrick Lamar, who are consciously writing on the page, crossing things out, adding things in. You, know, you can see the labor on the page results in a, in a different kind of rhyme, a different kind of density, I would say. Maybe fewer of those, those rhymes that are seem almost uh, diaphanous and in, in catching on on sound rather than really being uh, rooted in full connections. I think there's there's an aesthetic that is there to be exposed. I, I haven't written about it at length myself and I, don't, I haven't read anything that's that's really broken this down. Maybe somebody in the audience can do it one day, but I, I would love to read something that, that looked at the way that folks who, who rap uh, without the benefit of writing their rhymes down, uh, with how that sounds different from someone who is much more of a, a page-driven rapper. Yeah, it almost feels like a superpower, you know, when someone can freestyle like that. It just, it's really its own talent in a lot of ways. Um, Sue Ellen, I want to share one more poem of yours um, to talk a little bit more about rhyme and the way you play with it. Um, okay. This is uh, called Average. Tell us about this poem. Um, this is part a part of a, a actually part of the same sequence, but I wrote many poems about my parents as my mother was dying. I really reflected on their marriage and whatnot. So this is from that same series. Average. My father rated everything on a scale of one to 10. At a restaurant, when the waitress wanted to know if he'd enjoyed his meal, he'd say, I'd give it a six, which meant better than average, but there are lots of restaurants and who's to say that I won't find one where they have an even better strawberry shortcake. Three years after my mother died, he asked me how I'd rate my marriage. Things were good. I gave it a nine. He looked at me as if I called it average. I'm sorry for you, he said, as tears swelled in his eyes. I would have given mine a 12. <laughs> True story. True story. Um, here again, my hope is that it didn't really sound like a sonnet or even a rhyming poem. Um, there are a lot of things poets can do to make their rhymes more interesting and less obvious. I did it here. Um, 
partly through enjambment, which is, you know, where the sentence spills over the end of the line. So you don't pause in your reading when you get to the end of the line. I tried some of the different types of rhyme that um, I've that we've talked about, light rhyme, apocopated rhyme. Um, I tried to come up with rhymes that you don't usually expect to see together. Um, marriage and average, I don't think. And when you when you rhyme two words, you create a relationship between them. You know, it might not be conscious, but at some level, your mind is saying. Are all, is a happy marriage average? Is my marriage average? You know, you're joining the two, the two words. I rhymed the word waitress with the number six. You know, that's what I was trying to do all through these sonnets is to come up with rhymes that were unexpected and that would be a little bit of surprise when people got to them. And, and what, why? Why? Because I don't want to write Hallmark greeting card. <laughs> the main reason, you know, I don't want my poems to sound like the kind of poems I was turning away from when I when I was in college. I don't want to sound like that. I want someone to say, oh, that's a sonnet. Let me look at that more closely. That's what I want. Then why play with rhyme at all? Why play with rhyme at all? Well, you know, my father always said, why don't poems rhyme anymore? I'd read them if they rhyme. And there is something to be said. Uh, rhyme makes a poem more musical. It can be subtle. It can be very subtle. It makes it more musical and it makes it um, more memorable, I would say. I'm someone who recites poems to myself when I can't sleep. And try memorizing a long free verse poem. It's hard. So there's that. Um, I've already talked about how uh, rhyme can add resonance to the two words that you join. It lodges them in the ear and in the mind of your reader. Adam, what do you think? Um, why use rhyme if, in written poetry? You, you articulated some beautiful reasons I, I guess I would only add, and this is to step back more broadly and think about why add anything that dictates something to you as a creative person. You know, I, I come from a family of artists. I'm the only one who isn't. I try to with words every now and then, but I come from a family of painters and jewelry makers and so forth. And, and the one thing I learned in watching my mother, for instance, as a portrait painter work is that she needs constraint uh, in order to do her art. And it, it, the great poet Derek Walcott wrote at one point that the imagination wants its limits and delights in its limits. It finds its freedom in the definition of those limits. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a way that rhyme as a kind of limit, as a rule to the game, mm -hmm. uh, gives the mind what it needs to create that generative friction, that, that kind of spark that can make something uh, emerge in your, your feeling, in your thought, in the space of your creation that might not otherwise be there. It may, I, think, I know that it makes me more imaginative because sometimes in searching for that interesting, unusual rhyme, I am forced to invent something that did not happen or wasn't in the poem or I wasn't thinking of writing about. That has happened to me many times. It's actually, I think, an aid to imagination. And the same it holds with song lyrics. I see a question in the chat about writing rhymes and songwriters and whether they find it as a, as a limit or as a means of, of greater expression. I think it, it's, for a lot of writers, rhyme is, is something that they find really, really productive in their writing. And you know, so you take two extremes, Stephen Sondheim on one end and Bob Dylan on the other. And Sondheim, Sondheim has a, had a really rigorous perspective on how rhyme should work. Wanted full rhymes at all times. Mm -hmm. Thought that slant rhymes were, were basically uh, cheating. <laughs> and Dylan, uh, for his part, 
held to no such strict adherence to uh, how rhyme should work and, and love the idea of the play of sound. And you, you can hear that in, in across his, his archive. You can hear it too in the work of just pick a band. I mean, think of, uh, you know, Paul McCartney and, and John Lennon working together. Think of Paul McCartney writing uh, some of his most famous tunes. Uh, I'm thinking here of, of the great one, uh, gosh, well, it'll come to me, but there's, there's one in particular where he, he, has, he has this absurd rhyme that, that he used as the dummy lyric, as the lyric that he put in place initially while he was waiting for the, the, the real lyric to come to him. And, and it was, oh, I know what it was. It was for, for yesterday. And it was uh, scrambled, scrambled eggs. Oh, baby, how I love your legs. He just needed <laughs> to, stick, to stick the melody in place to have that rhyme of eggs and legs in there to, to capture what he wanted before he, he got yesterday into that space where it belonged. And, oh, and you know, I love that idea. Like, what did you call that? A dummy rhyme? A dummy lyric. Yeah. Dummy lyric. <laughs> I love that. Kind of a space holder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Sometimes like they stay on in lyrics, like uh, the song Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. That was initially the dummy lyric, but it, the, it was the songwriting duo whose name is escaping me at the moment, of course, because yeah. the bright light is on me. But uh, that they finally said, well, you know what? I can't think of anything that'll work better. So let's go with <laughs> Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. Uh, uh, oh, it's Burt Bacharach. Uh, Burt Bacharach. Yeah. Yeah, and now you can't imagine anything else fitting that, dun, 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 you know. <laughs> but that also gets to this connection between rhyme and rhythm, right? It's it's not just the way the words sound, it's the way they fit and are uh, accented and emphasized and match the notes if it's a song. Um, Adam, how would you characterize that relationship between rhythm and rhyme? Oh, it's it's... It's so fundamental in part because rhythm is the the heartbeat of both poetry and of song lyric. It's it's that that backbone, and it's not necessarily in the form always of met, metrical uh, verse, as as Sue Ellen so powerfully explained that that distinction between rhythm as it functions in 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 uh, poetic expression and and meter as the, the, the metronome, metronome that ticks away, uh, that's, that's the foundation. And I think across genres of songwriting, that relationship stands so that you, know, you, you have something like, uh, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. You know, that, it's that rhythm pattern that also dictates the form of the rhyme to follow. Tis of thee, liberty, that mosaic rhyme to go back to that mosaic rhyme relies on on the, that kind of uh, tethering of a pattern of rhythm and the expectation of rhyme across words. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because in literary poetry, you can have a poem that rhymes and does not have any kind of recognizable rhythmic pattern. And it can make for an interesting, very contemporary sounding effect. You can have, you know, lines that are this long next to lines that are this long. So there's no repeated rhythmic structure, but there's rhyme. So that's just a big difference, I guess, between rap and literary poems. Yeah. So Ellen, do you think more literary poets are playing with rhyme again? I wish I could say yes. Um, that has not been my experience. Um, I, I now I think that that suspicion about rhyme or that fear that they are going to fall into some kind of sing song rhythm and come up with elementary lame sounding rhymes. I think that's still pretty widespread. I would say free verse still rules in literary poetry. I'd agree. And I mean, you just have to open up a page of the New Yorker to see that that's often the case. Yeah. That said, I think there is a new generation of, of artists who have grown up, yes. particularly with hip hop as an influence. Yeah. And they don't have to themselves be hip hop fans even, but have grown up 
with it in the ether, just circulating in, in their, their headspace, who are finding ways to bring rhyme into their, their toolbox and to put that to work. And with more people writing poetry now than, than perhaps we've seen in, in decades, I think we'll, we'll see the rise of a, a new rhyme aesthetic, a renaissance of rhyme that, that may well take shape in the years to come. I think you're absolutely right. I think young poets are totally coming from a totally different place. They don't have that fear. They don't have that suspicion. They don't equate rhyme with childishness. And, and that would be a huge advantage. So I think you're right. Going forward, we're going to see a lot more rhyming poetry. Right. Well, we are almost out of time, but um, Swilin, you mentioned you recite poems to yourself as you're falling asleep. Um, I would love to get from both of you a couple of recommendations of poets or poems or rap artists who you think are really innovative in this area, uh, just to recommend to the audience. Oh, well, I mean, innovative. I'm looking for ones that I can memorize. I don't want yeah. to be too innovative. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, I started out, I have probably 25 poems that I, a little repertoire I can run through during my periods of insomnia. And it starts actually with Frost, both rhymed. And I have a long unrhymed poem of his that I've memorized too. Thomas Hardy, who was a great favorite of mine when I was an undergraduate at Middlebury. I've memorized some Thomas Hardy. Um, I'm trying to think. Philip Larkin, you know, kind of old school, kind of old school poets are who I've memorized because I find that rhythm and rhyme, that chant-like thing, I find it restful. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, again, it's easier to memorize and it helps me fall asleep. It is def. I mean, easier to memorize to the point where sometimes you might not want all the verses of Jerusalem in your head, and yet there they all are. Because... <laughs> there they are. There they are exactly. What about you, Adam? Gosh, uh, well, you know, Frost actually is is one of my go tos as well. I, I was taught at home until high school by my grandmother, who was a great lover of poetry and particularly a lover of Robert Frost, and and so I memorized stopping by woods on the snowy evening as a seven-year-old and have a repertoire of, of probably just almost as many as, as Sue Ellen in terms of the poems that, that circulate in, in my brain. And, and it's, it's wonderful to have those there. I, we're not in a, in a culture at the moment that necessarily thinks about what looks like rote memorization as a productive thing, but I think poetry is an exception because to be able to be in command of poetic language in that, in that way, to recite it as if it is one's own, uh, particularly to invoke the first person singular in, in, in naming yourself as a speaker, the poem quite literally is a, a, a revolutionary thing for young people. So I still encourage the students that I work with and going all the way down to the K through 12 ranks when I go into the classrooms to, to think about memorization as a possible little spur to one's own creativity and to, to creating a, a connection to language that's so distinctive. And this is what Planet Word does at its best is to make these kinds of connections and why I've been so proud to be a part of uh, the family at Planet Word. As far as particular poets, I mean, I, I had the privilege of interviewing a bunch of them for a mag magazine article I did for the New York Times style magazine, T. Uh, just last month and I talked to a handful of my favorite poets and asked them for a handful of their favorite rappers. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to check that out. But I mean, among some of the names are Morgan Parker, uh, you know, Los Angeles based poet, Adrian Matika out of Indiana, Kyle Dargan, whom I, whom I mentioned before from Washington DC, Nate Marshall, um, Khadija Queen, host of, of young poets with a, uh, uh, connection to the rhythms and rhymes of hip hop, finding a way to tether those with inspirations drawn from across the, the, the poetic traditions in the global context. It's just a beautiful thing to see that play out on the page and in our ears. I agree. I think memorizing poems is a wonderful thing for young people. When you memorize a poem, it is in your head for life. 
I memorized a Wordsworth poem in high school. I could still recite it. And when you have that poem in your head, you can recite it when you're upset, when you can't sleep. You know, there are any number of circumstances in which the ability to recite a poem to yourself would be soothing and consoling. So Sue Ellen and Adam, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been lovely to spend an hour with you. Um, thank you audience for being here and for your smart questions. And if you haven't had a chance to come to Planet Word, you do get to explore songwriting and all those kinds of rhymes and our poetry nook uh, where you can listen to dozens and dozens of poems from all different styles, free verse, limerick, haiku. Uh, do come visit when you get a chance. Thank you all so much for joining us. We appreciate your support of Planet Word. Good night.